Our text for today is taken from the book of Colossians, the first chapter beginning with the first verse. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossa, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Heavenly Father, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth, and now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There was a comic a number of years ago. I don't know that they even have very many comic strips in the newspaper anymore. Um, I think there was a time when I was in college where I would read the newspaper for the comics just to get a little smile on my face because let's face it, some of the news that we see it's a little depressing after a while. But there was somebody walking into a church service and he sees his friend, Bob. He says, oh shoot, we're supposed to be praying for Bob this week. So he says a quick prayer, God, please bless Bob. And he says, hey Bob, I've been praying for you. That is not what we see here in the text from the Apostle Paul. He honestly prays for the people. And I thought it would be interesting to tear apart his prayer for the Colossians, because really, isn't it a prayer for all Christians? And so I worked with this this last week. And I want to take it section by section. What does he pray for? Sometimes it sounds like he's praying for the same thing, but I don't know that he really is. First off, he says, be filled with the knowledge of his will. When I teach catechism class, we come across that passage that I make the kids memorize, that they're supposed to be in the word of God richly, and I make the point to every confirmation class, if you only worked one hour a week, would you think you'd become rich? And of course, they would say no. At least if they're honest, they would say no. Well, how do you think giving God one hour a week is going to make you rich in his word? Obviously, it takes a whole lot more than that. It takes... Praying, and Paul is an example to us in that, isn't he? He's praying for the people constantly. They talk about the people that they've served and met and who are now being trained by people that Paul trained himself often to take over in his place after he moved on to a new position or new place. Be filled with the knowledge of his will. God's word isn't just a knowledge thing. Faith in God is not just a knowledge thing.
thing. The ancient church used three Latin words to describe all the components of faith. Yes, if we don't study God's word, if we're not looking at it, obviously our faith can't grow. So there is that, scientia. We get our modern word science from that Latin term. Knowledge. But Jesus himself says, even Satan knows there is a God. That knowledge doesn't necessarily mean that you have faith. Just because you might know facts from the Bible, it doesn't mean that you have faith. Even Satan quotes scripture, doesn't he? And often misquotes it to try to tempt us to lead us away from God. Ascentia means to accept or to really receive would be a better word. A lot of times I'll change the prayer if there's that word accept, because I think in modern theology that word accept means something it doesn't really mean in the prayers or in the intent of the prayers that are recorded in our book. We receive God's word. And Ascentia really stresses the power of the Holy Spirit. That God's word is truth. And it doesn't need our stamp of approval or need us to go about changing it or doing something else to it to make it more acceptable to certain people. Because if we change God's word, and God himself says this in scripture, it's no longer his word. It's something else. So the truth about faith is that it has to be received. It's not something I can decide to do. Or a prayer that I pray to pray God into my heart. In the picture, and I think we have it hanging up in the fellowship hall, I believe it was Albrecht Durer when he painted the picture of Jesus knocking on the door. It's interesting, the hinges open the door into the house. And he was theologically correct in his painting, we might say, that Christ has to push the door of our hearts open. The Holy Spirit has to push the hearts of our, the doors of our hearts open. Then the last one you might recognize from Banks is fiducia, fiducial. They want, God wants us to trust him. That's the other and last part of faith. All three of these make up faith and all three need to grow together. And so it's, is it any wonder that Paul prays really for their faith to grow? in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, not only of the knowledge of God's word, but looking and understanding things from a spiritual standpoint. How far do you go with this? Do we always see things from a spiritual standpoint? Or is it just sometimes we see the needs that are right in front of us? Do we think about the health of our church in overall terms? Right now we have a pastor and teacher shortage. I'll be honest with you, the churches that I've seen that are the healthiest, guess what? They're the ones that are also sending young people on to study to become pastors and teachers who invest in their youth. Who see the need in the future, not just the needs right now. Are we thinking in terms like that? Thinking of spiritual things. And he goes on, that you walk worthy of the Lord. That you live according to the faith to which you were called. Fully pleasing him. 
He delights in you, and he wants you to delight in him. Being fruitful in every good work. One of the most awesome and blessed things about good works is that you, when you're doing them, you don't even realize you're doing them because they're just so natural to you. Helping someone. Money wants us to grow in that. And there's, let's be honest, one of the basic things that we are by nature is selfish. When do I get some my time? I still have kids at home. They're not at the stage anymore where it's daddy, 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 daddy. But I just spent a couple days with some of my family members and I remember that stage because I heard that stage from some of the younger children that we were with. Mommy, 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 mommy. And it gets to the point where it grates on you, where you need a break from it. But God wants us to show love to one another. And in this, Jesus himself was so incredible, wasn't he? When the people wouldn't leave him alone, but kept hounding him. If there was any time that Jesus had a, had a right to say, you know, can I just get five minutes here? It said he had compassion on the people because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Sharing the gospel is the greatest good work we could do. And again, we consider the future of our church. I took a class on evangelism and church health after I had become a pastor and after I was appointed to the board of evangelism for our synod. And I agreed with some of the things in the class, the, the heart of it was right. It showed the church as five pillars, like an old Roman style building. One pillar was stewardship, one pillar was fellowship, one pillow, pit pillar was evangelism, one pillar was worship, and the other pillow was education. And it drove home the point that a healthy church addresses all of these things. Puts emphasis on worship, puts emphasis on education and hearing the word of God. On fellowship, on caring for one another. On evangelism and on stewardship. And then he goes on that we increase in the knowledge of God. Seeing all of these things, understanding how all of these things work together in our church. And then the last part of his prayer, strengthened with all might. That you are prepared and can handle all kinds of personal things, all kinds of church things. For all patience and long-suffering with joy. We know that in this world there's going to be pain. That we did. We brought sin into this world. There is going to be pain. There, is going, there are even times when we might have to suffer for the sake of the gospel. There are times that as we grow in the faith, as we become educated in the faith as we become the strong ones in the faith that there are times when we might have to put up with the weaknesses of others or reach out to them and try to help them but he also prays that we're strong enough that if we have to suffer for the sake of the gospel we rejoice in doing so because we know that it's proof that we are connected to Christ who also suffered, didn't he? 
the world hated him. A lot of times, in a lot of ways, the world is going to hate us too, right? Just because they hated him. Because the world doesn't want to hear that they're not in control of everything. God is. They're not the judge, jury, and executioner. God is. For the Christian, we couldn't be more happy in hearing that. Because we know how much he suffered. And how much he dearly and deeply loves us. I don't want to quote it too often, but we come back to that same little song, don't we? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. As we consider all the nuances of Paul's prayer, we know that he was praying this for us too. And that we should be praying this prayer for ourselves, for our church, for our church body, and for all those all over the world where the gospel is being preached. That they too grow in the grace of God and in his knowledge and in his love. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, let that peace be with our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.